Hello, uh, I'm Jimmy. I'm a staff software engineer at Kata. So today I will talk about automatic refactoring in large Python code bases. Um, so uh, we have a large code base and we want to solve two problems, uh, code formatting and type checking. Those are common Python code base problems, but it's uh, especially challenging in our large code base. So uh, we are Carta, so it's a financial service provider. Um, so we provide online tools for staff founders to issue staff options to their employees. Or when investor invest money on staff, investor get stocks from the staff. So all those different people, they can use Carta to manage their equity. And other than those, they can also trade and also get other services on top of uh, this platform, including compensation, valuation, tax, and fund admins. So we have a large code base that has developed for 10 years. It's Python code managed in Git. It has more than 2 million slides and 30,000 files. Every day, 200 de active developers uh, continue to uh, commit changes to it. So with such frequent updates every day, it will be hard if we want to uh, commit a large change. Let's say we want to modify 20,000 files at the same time. Uh, it's hard to merge this change because it will be basically conf conflicts with everyone's uh, change. And let's talk about code formatting. So uh, Python, provides pretty flexible code style. So you can write the same code in very different format. Uh, so in this example, the red block and the green block, they are actually the same code in different format. You can uh, use single quotes versus dub double quotes for string or use different indentation to wrap or unwrap the lines into multiple lines or uh, combine a lot of things in one line. In a large code base, if every developer they are using different formats, then the code base will be less easy to read. Uh, so we will want to apply a consistent format that way everyone can read and write fast. So luckily, uh, there's a popular tool Black for that, and we want to apply Black in our large code base. And it comes with the problem we just talked about. We couldn't just run black on our large code base all at once. It's hard to merge such big change. And what if we take a different approach with split the changes as smaller pieces, each one only modify uh, like 20 files, then we can incrementally convert our code base uh, into 100% uh, black format coverage. Uh, so this approach may work, but it comes with other challenge. It will introduce actual work. You will need to uh, spend some effort on creating and managing those uh, small changes. You also need to make sure those changes, they don't overlap to each other. And another challenge is since it's an incremental process, we need an effective way to make sure the developers don't introduce regressions during this process. If some developer, they uh, reformat the code into a different format, then it's um, causing regression. And we also want to uh, apply type checking in our code base. Uh, so in Python, it's common to get a lot of type related errors like attribute error, type error, or value error. It's because uh, Python is not a strong type language. And uh, one effective way to catch those is to get the help from MyPy. Um, so if we have MyPy type checker running, it could have make those uh, suggestions like the blue box and help our developer catch them. But uh, in order to get my pie working, we would need to add type annotations. So for each function definition, we would need to add the annotation for each parameter and return. And those 
the hard work that looks simple, but in a large code base, it's challenging because in our code base, there are more than 100,000 uh, files. Uh, 100,000 functions, that means type of patient. And if we would need to manually annotate each one, it will take forever to finish. So that's uh, also challenging. And our solution uh, is to use automatic refactoring to solve all those problems and challenges. So the idea is what if we can automate those incremental code changes? Uh, if we can do that, we can solve large scale tech debt problems in large code, code base. And let's take a look at how a code change uh, life cycle looks like. So this is actually how our developers uh, do their job every day. They will uh, take some code paths uh, that they want to apply some code change. They make the code change, create a pull request, then it will kick off some continuous integration tests and the test may pass. Then they will want to add some reviewer to review the change. If the test fail, it could be the change is wrong. So it should be remade or it could be just flaky test. Then maybe retry after some time, we'll make the test pass. And after adding reviewers, um, if we get enough reviews and approved, we can merge the change. Otherwise we may need to add more reviewers or sometimes need to add, need to notify the reviewers in another channel like Slack. And, and sometimes we also need to uh, rebase the pull request uh, to apply the latest change from the main branch or merge or when there's merge conflict, we need to close the pull request and then recreate a new one later. And so in this life cycle, we want to automate everything. So the pin block are those we identify can be automated. So we want to build a automated refactoring framework to automate those. Then let's talk about the design and the implementation of this framework. So there are uh, several considerations we want to design. The first one is the size of the code change. We want to make sure each code change is not too big. Otherwise, it's not easy to review. It's not too small. Otherwise, we, won't, we will need to create too many pull requests which introduce too much overhead. So uh, one way to work uh, solve this is to uh, just while we walk through the file tree of the large code base, we can count the number of uh, Python files in a subtree, and we only take the subtree as the target uh, or, uh, code change uh, path when the number of files is less than our defined threshold. So this is one way to implement it. Another consideration is the number of pending pull requests. If we create too much, then we will introduce too, mu too much work to our developers because they still need to do their daily job. If we create too many, then they will need to spend all of their time on reviewing automated pull requests. They won't have enough time to do their work. And if we don't create enough, then we won't be making progress. So uh, one way to implement this is we can potentially add a consistent label automated refactoring to each created pull request. That way we can use uh, the GitHub command uh, line tool, GH, to do a query like this to search all the pending pull requests that has this automatic refactoring label. So we can run this query to check the pending number of pull requests and only starting to create more when it's less than the desired threshold. And the next consideration is we want to avoid duplications for each code change. So 
uh, that is to avoid conflicts. And we can encode the path that we are modifying as part of the pull request. Uh, one way to implement this is to encode the information as part of the Git branch name. So for example, for black formatting related changes, we could uh, potentially use black formatting as the prefix and the target directory name as the prospect. And another consideration is incremental adoption. So we want to avoid regression while we adopt it so we can introduce an enrollment process so the idea is when a file is black formatted, we add the file path to an enrollment list. So it's a text file that consists a lot of paths. That way we set up a continuous integration job that always run black formatting check on all the files on this enrollment list. So we can make sure no future code changes can break the uh, Black formats on any of the file. So with this approach, eventually we will add all the files paths into this list. Then at that time we can uh, remove th this list because we reach 100% coverage. Uh, this same approach can also be applied on um, type of annotation adoption process or any other problems. So um, in order to simplify the implementation, we can uh, implement each uh, pin um, box uh, as independent jobs. So let's think of this as a production line. So each job is an independent job that move the pull request from one state to the next state. So it's like state machine transition. And so, if we make each job independent, we can just run those jobs periodically. So that then they can just move the pull request forward to the, to the end of the life cycle. And what are the jobs needed? We need a job to apply code change and create a pull request, another job to create to check the test status and add a reviewer if it passed tests, another job to check the review status and add more reviewers or send Slack notifications. And if it's approved, another job will merge the pull request and another job to close the pull request if conflicts happened. And we also need to provide an API for our application, the refactoring applications. Uh, for example, we can use uh, Python abstract best class to define an API uh, refactoring applications. And then uh, an application like Black Formating can just focus on implementing the API to provide needed metadata. So the metadata we would need when creating the pull request, including the pull request title, the labels we want to add, the body, the commit message, so with those, we can provide uh, deep enough detailed information when creating the pull request. Then the reviewer can just base on what we provided in the pull request to review the change. We can uh, implement uh, the two different function. Uh, the first one is skip a path because we know it's an incremental process. So um, we want to provide a helper for each application to decide whether they want to uh, work on a pass or want to skip it. And for black formatting, we talk about using an enrollment list. So black enroll that text. So we can just use a helper to check whether this path is already enrolled. If it's enrolled, then we want to skip. The most important logic is in this refactor API. So we want to do two things. The first is given the path that we want to apply, we want to refactor, we will run black commit and given the path, then black will format the entire path. 
And the second step is to add the path to our enrollment list. So with an API like this, the application just need to focus on the uh, metadata and the refactoring logic. And the remaining work is taken care of by the framework of automatic refactoring. So in order to implement periodical job, we can use GitHub workflows. You just need to add a YAML file like this in the GitHub workflows directory in your code base. Uh, with this config example, you can set up a job to run every 30 minutes during the workday um, and it runs some Python code. Uh, let's take a look at some job examples. So first job is to apply code change and create a pull request. We can use Py GitHub to create a pull request easy. Uh, when you use GitHub workflow, you can easily uh, get the provided the GitHub tokens and get the current GitHub repository name to set up the Py GitHub library. Then the main logic here is to basically walk through each refactoring application by calling the subclass helper. For each application, we want to uh, check what's the current pending number of PRs. If only if it's less than the desired uh, threshold, then we will fetch the next path and then run the refactor logic. And then we will, after that we already refactor the code, we will commit the change and then put, create the pull request. And when creating the pull request and making the commit, we are using all the metadata provided by the application. Another example job is to merge the approved pull request. So again, we are using PyGitHub to make a query to find all those approved pull requests. And for each found pull request, we can just call the merge helper to merge it. Uh, in the earlier example, we use black command to refactor the code. You may want to build some custom refactoring yourself. In that case, uh, we can use some other tool. Let's take a uh, type annotation as example. So let's say we want to add some missing types. Some of the simple functions we can base on simple heuristic and inference to add the missing types. For example, some functions like init function, they don't have any return statement. We will want to add return now. And some functions, they only have one single uh, return statement at the end and it's returning a simple string uh, like this get bar function. We will want to add uh, str as the return type. So, um, we can use libcst uh, to implement a uh, transformer to uh, do this refactoring for EC. So in libcst, it provides some helper to help us convert the source code as a uh, syntax tree. So we can call the uh, parse module in our refactor logic to convert the text as a syntax tree, the root node is a module. Then we can call our uh, transformer add missing non-return to convert the syntax tree to add the missing non-type. And then eventually we uh, uh, replace the original file as the updated code. So the logic are in this add missing non-return so it's a transformer which allows us to uh, register some callback function to be called during the tree traversal. We can uh, define visit function definition function to register a function. It will be called whenever we enter a function definition node. So with this, we can uh, implement uh, this uh, so basically we need a counter, which is the return count. We initialize it as zero. Whenever we enter a function definition, we also reset it as zero. And then when we 
found and return statement, we increment the counter. And then at the end of the function definition subtree traversal in the leaf function, we will check whether this current function definition is missing return type. And if it's re missing return type and the counter is zero, that means this function return nothing. So we can safely add the return annotation as now. So this is a simple example. So we can build more complex uh, refactor. Um, and some other more complex uh, dynamic types, you may want to get help by collecting runtime types. So we can use monkey type tool for this. You, monkey type is open, an open source tool. You can run your program along with monkey type to collect the traces of each function call. And then you can run monkey type command to apply the collected types to your code. So uh, with this, you can just run monkey type in the refactor step to um, apply the refactoring. So uh, we already covered the implementation. Then let's talk about how it works in Kata. So if for black formatting, we made black to, uh, tool available in our code base uh, in 2020. But after a long time, not much people start to use it because it required manually run black until we uh, start automatic refactoring work. We were able to quickly ramp up the coverage to 100% in a few months. So now our entire code base is in black formats. Uh, similar pattern happened in type annotation. So our type annotation coverage, it was uh, growing pretty slowly since 2019 until we uh, use automatic refactoring to add the missing types. We were able to quickly increase the coverage in a few months and we are still continuing the work while we're working on increase the type coverage to make my type more useful, we have seen the number of type errors in our production environment decreased over time. Um, the number is uh, fluctuating. Uh, it depends on the uh, users and the traffic to our service. Yeah, but we do see uh, trending is decreasing. So here are the summary of the talk. So uh, automatic refactoring is useful if you have a large code base and many tech debt to solve because the automatic refactoring framework, it enables you to save a lot of manual effort. It also allows you to fix tech debt problems incrementally and continuously. And it's not only applicable to Python. So when we implement our framework, we make the API extensible for other programming language. So we are actually also using it for uh, TypeScript in Carta. So that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. So if you are interested in more technical things in Carta, we have an engineering blog um, medium. We also have a lot of jobs opening. Um, and for all the tools mentioned in the talk, you can find the links here. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, is there any questions? We do have a couple minutes for questions. Would you like to come up? Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, a question from experience. So in large uh, monorepos or in large repositories, oftentimes you end up with multiple copies of the same files, modules, etc. And each of those copies can then develop a life on its own. So during the refactoring phase like this one, uh, what's your approach for identifying the duplicates and dealing with 
duplicates that may have diverged by then? Um, yeah, I think uh, duplication is uh, it's a common problem in large code base. And um, based on my experience, uh, I, I, I didn't uh, solve this problem yet, but uh, I know some uh, people may use some tools to detect the uh, duplications like Sonar Cube, and then uh, just analyze the code and try to fix the, the uh, duplicated code uh, manually, but that is not uh, scalable. Um, yeah, w a another approach we did is we try to uh, develop some tools that can help us uh, I mark some piece of code as uh, deprecated code and forbid the other people to use it uh, using linters. So we uh, do develop a, a tool called uh, decomposition toolkit to help our developers use it to mark the code and then they can track the progress of, they can count the number of references uh, in a dashboard and then eventually the linter will prevent new reference yeah, that, that is my experience. Hi, Jimmy, great talk, thanks. Um, so it seems like this framework would be pretty useful for anyone running on GitHub. Any plans to open source it? Or do you, are you aware of anything already open source that's in similar state? Um, yeah, that's a good question. As far as I know, I didn't know any uh, service like this is open sourced and uh, in our uh, inter implementation in Carta, we we started the implementation with Circle CI, not uh, GitHub workflows. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's probably more easier to use if it's implemented in, in GitHub workflows. Um, so that is something I will uh, consider to discuss with my team to uh, make it open source, yeah, because we, other than the implementation of the workflow, we did implement it a lot of uh, Python helpers to make building the framework easier. So th that library could potentially be uh, open sourced. Okay. Well, that's all our time. So thank you so much, Jimmy, for your presentation. Thank you.